Come on, he's worthy. You know, I'm so, I'm so thrilled to see you in church tonight. And, and this is why, because I believe this room, this is not a gathering place for perfect people. This is not a place that if you're good enough, you can come to church. This is a hospital. And I'm so excited to see you in church today because I believe that every word that God gives us will refine us, will grow us, will heal us, will make us whole, will set us free, will give us a joy we don't have, will break addictions that we've been carrying. Come on, I believe this, that God has a word for you tonight. And if you're in this room, you've had a rough week, a rough day, a rough start to this new year, I have good news for you. Jesus has a plan for your life. He has purpose and a destiny for you. He has hope for the depressed. He has healing for the sick. He has freedom for those that are bound. And he has that for you today. How many believe God has a word for you tonight? For those online as well, God has a word for you. I want us to bow our heads as we pray. Father, speak to us tonight. We're not here for man's opinion. We're not here to hear from, from a person, God. We want to hear from you. So speak to our heart, God. Our hearts are open. Our minds are open, God. And we receive your word tonight. Speak, Lord. And have your way. In Jesus' name we will all say, Amen. You may be seated. Give your neighbor a high five as you take your seat and just tell him, I'm glad to see you in church tonight. If you're online right now, welcome to service. So glad you're tuning in. I am so pumped. Right now we are going through scripture. Tonight is going to be a verse-by-verse -verse teaching. I hope we're okay with that. Some, some straight-up Bible teaching. Are we okay to just study the Bible tonight? We're going to study the Bible tonight, and we're going to cover a portion of Scripture that we covered this week. As a church, we are in this book called the Daily Growth Book. How many have your Daily Growth Book? You got a Daily Growth Book. Come on. The Daily Growth Book, we are studying 10 books of the Bible this year, and currently as a church, we're studying the book of Matthew. And this week, we read from Matthew chapter 8. It was one of the portions of Scriptures we read, or, or we, we will read. And the portion of scripture I want to, I believe that God has a word for us tonight that I want to share with you is Matthew 8, verses 14 through 22. We'll see how much we get through. But I'm going to read that together. Let's put it on the screen. It says, when Jesus arrived at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. But when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her. Then she got up and prepared a meal for him. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out the evil spirits with a simple command, and he healed all the sick. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, who said, he took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. I don't know how much we're going to get through tonight. I believe God is going to speak to us. But the title of this message tonight is God Saved Me for a Reason. Someone say it with me. Say, God saved me for a reason. See, it's not by chance or by accident. It's not by chance or accident that you're here in this room listening to these words, that you're online listening and tuning in. It's not by chance. God has a plan and a purpose for you, and there's a reason for your life, and we're going to unpack that a little bit tonight. I want to start with, I have three points for you. We're, gonna, we're not going to take long, but let's jump right in. Point number one, Jesus sees the unseen. He sees the unseen. Look at verse 14. I want to read that verse again. Jesus, arri Jesus arrived at Peter's house, and Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. Let me bring some context. Jesus was, at this time, doing a lot of ministry. He was healing sick people. He was healing a leper. He just got done. He healed a, a, uh, a Roman officer's servant, did all kinds of ministry, did all kinds of things, and then he arrives here at Peter's house. This is after a long day. He was teaching all day, and he comes to Peter's house, and he comes to, and Peter is, 
by no means, he's not like a rich guy. He was a fisherman by trade. He, he did, probably didn't have a rich and fancy house. He's from Bethsaida, which is probably a poor area at the time. But as he goes to this little old measly house, this, this little old family's house, and sees this mother-in-law, his mother-in-law was sick with a fever. And, and, at the, and what's so interesting, what I think is so interesting about this portion of Scripture, his mother-in-law, I'm sure he knows, probably knows her, but in the Scripture, she has no name. We're talking about Peter's mother-in-law. Peter, one of the greatest disciples, probably one of the biggest names in the Bible. His mother-in-law doesn't even have a name. Now, that's messed up. But here's what's so important. There's several other people in Scripture, they have, they've been named. People that were healed, people that did great things, they have names. But for some reason, this person, this woman, has no name. We can't say her name, but we can say that she was important to Jesus. God saw her need and was there to heal her. God saw that she was sick in the corner, dying from a fever. And at this time, a fever is not just take an Advil and just sleep it out. Like today, we just said, oh, it's got to wait it out, just kind of sweat it out. No, a fever at this time is probably lethal. She's going to die in days. And she's there in a room just dying, and her life is dying away. No one else sees her. No one is paying attention to her. But when Jesus comes into the house after a long day of ministry, he locks eyes on her and says, there's a need here, and I'm going to meet that need. What's the point of all this? See, the point is this. You could feel like you're not seen, like you're not important, like you're not valuable to people, like you're sick and you're dying and you're down and out right now with the spiritual fever. You got, you, you, in days, you feel like you're going to give up. And Jesus sees you right where you're at. And he knows that he can meet that need in your life. Jesus sees this woman and heals her. You may feel like you don't got a name in this world. You feel like you're nameless. People don't know you. You might feel like you're overlooked. You may feel like people uh, uh, just see you and walk by. They don't appreciate who you are. You know that none of that even matters because God loves you. The creator of the heavens and the earth sees you. Not only does he see you, but he sees your need. He sees your sickness. He sees what's lacking. He sees your, the brokenness in your heart. Come on, he sees when no one else knows the pain you're going through. He sees it, and he has the answer. He has the healing, and he has your breakthrough. How many believe that tonight? See, the world has its own standard of value, but God has his own standard of value. And the standard of value is not the same. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, it says, don't judge by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him, God says. The Lord doesn't see the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, I feel like sometimes we think that in order to be great, we have to be great according to the world's standards. You have to be the smartest. You have to make the most money. You have to be the most popular. You have to have it all together. You have to have a perfect track record. You have to have no history, uh, no record, no strikes, no speeding tickets. You're just Mr. and Mrs. Perfect. And we think that this standard of value according to the world, and if we don't meet that standard, then we have very low value. Well, I got good news for you. God does not compare you the same way the world compares you. God does not look for your perfection in order to please him. God does not look for people that are self-righteous and got it all together. God, as a matter of fact, is looking for the person that knows they're jacked up, they're messed up, they don't got it all together unless they got Jesus. God is looking for someone that's acknowledging, I need a Savior. Is there anyone in here tonight that needs a Savior? Is there anyone in here tonight that knows they're not perfect, they've messed up, they're not the smartest, they may not be the best looking, you may not have it all together, you may not make as much money as the person next to you, but I got something that the world does not have. I got love from a Savior. I got freedom. I got breakthrough. I got joy. When the, what the world cannot do, Jesus can in my life. 
This is why, this is why you see people on stage crushing idols and celebrating that they're breaking ties with their past. This is why you have a line of men that used to be drug addicts and in prison their whole life coming up here and celebrating in front of a church that they not, they're not who they used to be. This is why you have ex-adulterers, ex-murderers, ex-fornicators, ex-addicts, ex-immoral living, ex-depressed, ex-lost, ex-suicidal, ex-people, ex-whatever, doing great things for God today. Come on, I hope I'm talking to the right room. I'm not here to talk to perfect people. God's not looking for your perfection. He's looking for your heart that says, God, I surrender. I'm done trying to do this on my own. I'm done resisting your call in my life. God, I surrender, and I give it all to you. Is there anyone in here that's ready to surrender to the king, the one who can give you hope tonight? You're probably wondering, why are all these people screaming and standing up and shouting? People, here's the thing, people love an underdog story. I mean, no one likes a movie where, where the underdog loses at the end. That movie will not sell one ticket at the box office. The movies that sell are when the underdog comes in, it looks like he's going to lose and he's got nothing, but he comes out with the championship belt at the end. I wonder if we got some underdogs in this room here. You didn't start off all together. Your family's not perfect. As a matter of fact, your family's crazy. As a matter of fact, you're the craziest one in your family. But it don't matter. God's looking for, come on, God's looking for someone that says, I may, be, I may have no name in this world, but God is calling me, and he's knitted me. Before he knitted me in my mother's womb, he had a plan for my life. He appointed me, and he set me apart. Look, I'm not up here to tell you I'm perfect and I got it all together. I'll be the first to say I make mistakes. I don't have a perfect track record. But I thank God that Jesus took all of my sin and affliction on the cross when he died on the cross and said, it's okay, give me your sin and I'll give you my perfection. Give me your failure and I'll give you my righteousness. God is good. See, it's not you that makes you great. It's Jesus that makes you great. Jesus paid close attention to those that were overlooked. We see this over and over and over in Scripture. We see that people try to bring children to him, and there was, the disciples were like, get those children back. We're, we're, here, we're here to do business, not play with kids. And Jesus says, stop, let the little children come to me. We see the Canaanite woman who was begging for a healing for her daughter. And she was begging and begging and begging. And, and people were saying, get that woman away. And God says, your daughter is healed in Jesus' name. <laughs> Jesus paid close attention to the blind man who did not have no sight. And he healed him. Jesus paid close attention to the poor widow that gave out of, her, out of her poverty. She gave two little mites. It was a little she had, but she gave everything. And Jesus paid attention to that poor widow. Jesus paid attention to the blind beggar. Jesus paid attention to tax collectors. Jesus paid attention to fishermen. Jesus paid attention to the leper, to the sick, to the, to, come on. Jesus paid attention to the person in this room. You were addicted, you were lost, you were bound, you were depressed, you were angry, you were suicidal, you are a murderer. You got, come on, Jesus is paying attention to you tonight. Will you respond to the call of God on your life? He sees the unseen. Not only does Jesus see the unseen, but he also uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. That's God's specialty. That's God's like, he, he's a master at that. Look at Acts 14, 13 to 14. It says, now when the men of the Sanhedrin, what is a Sanhedrin? It's this Jewish high court. These are the big shots in the religious times. These were the guys that people traveled all over the world and, 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 and just esteemed to be a disciple of one of these guys. He wanted to be a Sanhedrin. So the Sanhedrin, now when the men of the Sanhedrin, they saw the confidence and boldness of Peter and John and grasped grasp the fact that they were uneducated and untrained ordinary men, they were astounded. 
they were astounded and began to recognize one thing. They did not recognize their education. They did not recognize their training. They did not recognize their talent. They did not recognize their gifts and their talents and their good looks and all these other things. They did not recognize any of that stuff. The only thing that the Sanhedrin recognized about these men is that they had been with Jesus. See, the world is not looking for you to showboat. The world is not looking for you to flaunt that you got it all together. The world is looking for someone to spend some time with Jesus. The world is looking for the answer. His name is Jesus, the Savior, the Redeemer, the Healer, the Provider. Come on, he's the only one that can save us and set us free. He's the answer. We're not God's gift to the world. We are not some, you know, just throw out the red carpet for me, I'm coming in. We're here to recognize that without Jesus, I'm nothing. But I thank God that he called me and he chose me some ordinary person, some ordinary untrained person to do great things for the kingdom of God. So it says, verse 14, and seeing the man who had been healed standing there with them, they had nothing to say in reply. See, you may feel like you're not the smartest or the strongest in the world, but with Jesus, you can do extraordinary things. 1 Corinthians 1.27, it says, in instead God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. Have you ever felt like a fool? Have you ever been a fool? You being a fool right now? Just kidding. God chose the, what things the world considers foolish to shame those who think they're wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those that are powerful. You ever felt weak? You ever felt like you couldn't do it? You ever been in those moments where you feel like you do not know how you're going to make it? You know those weak moments, the moments you feel like you just don't know what you're going to do tomorrow or the next week. You don't know how, you're gonna, how, how, it's gonna, how your family's going to make it. You don't know how you're going to get through. What God is saying is, I'm choosing those that, that, the, those that the world considers foolish, those that the world considers weak. I'm choosing you to do extraordinary things and to confound the wise and to confound the powerful. He uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. God is choosing you to preach to the world. God is choosing you to bring healing to the sick. God is choosing you to cast out demons. God is use, you, choosing you to preach the gospel to, to your workplaces, to your family, to your friends. See, I believe that the days, and we've said this before, the days of superstar Christians, they're over. The days of superstar Christianity where we're just worshiping the guy at the pulpit. Those days are done. I believe that God is saying it's time for the former fool, the former weak, the ordinary, the uneducated, the ex this, the ex that, the untrained to step up and reveal God's love and power to the world. Come on church, it's time for you to step up and do what God has called you to do. We got to stop depending on Pastor Marco to go out and save all these cities and to reach the lost. God is calling you to reach your family. God is calling you to reach your friends. God is calling you to reach your workplaces. You don't need a degree in theology to do it. You don't need some seminary or school graduate degree. And if you have that, praise the Lord. That is awesome. You don't need that. What you need is love. What you need is the power of God. What you need is a testimony that says, I was once jacked up. I was blind, but now I see. God save me. Let's keep it going. Number two. We're barely on verse 14, by the way. Look, oh, Matthew, Matthew, uh, let's go back to Matthew chapter 8. We're going to go now to verse 15. So now... He sees this unnamed woman, and he sees that she was sick, and it says, but when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her. Then she got up and prepared a meal for him. Jesus touched her. She was instantly healed. One touch from God. One touch from God. 
and what was meant to kill her was gone. See, one touch from God in our lives and whatever the enemy used against you, it may have you pinned down. You may be on the final count to give up, but one touch from God, one encounter with the Lord, and whatever was there to kill you and take you out must go, and it must flee and bow at the name of Jesus. See, I don't think we realize how powerful our God is. All it takes is one touch for you to be set free and healed in Jesus' name. It says, then she got up and prepared a meal for him. Second point is, we are healed for a purpose. See, we're healed not just to say we're healed. We're not healed just for the sake of being whole. We're not saved just for the sake of being saved. God saved me for a reason. I've been saved for a purpose. The right response to being saved is devoting our lives to serve the king. See, this woman had the, go back to verse 15 for me. This woman had the right response. She, it says that the fever left her. Then she got up and prepared a meal for him. Just imagine her on her deathbed. God touches her. She gets up and says, what do you want to eat? I got, I cook you the best meal. One second, let me get it together. Let me cook it up for you. I want to serve my king. I want to serve my savior. I want to serve my healer. I want to serve my deliverer. I want to serve the one who, who set me free. I want to serve him. That's the right response to someone that's healed, saved, and set free. When we serve God, you know that God rewards you? I mean, it's our natural right response. It's what we must do. It's our duty. And as a matter of fact, I could serve God the rest of my life, and, and he, he doesn't owe me anything else. He's gave, he gave it all to me on the cross. However, God still rewards you when you serve him. Look at uh, in Matthew 25, 11. It says, the master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. God celebrates when you serve him, even in the little things. Your faithfulness to serve God causes you to grow. If you're not growing, if you're not, as it says here, go back to that scripture really quick, Matthew 25. If you're not growing, if you're not, it says, you know, it says, go back to, there it is, it says, I will give you many more responsibilities. If you're not seeing that happen in your life, it's probably because we're not living to serve him. God, how come I'm not growing? How come, how come they're growing? You don't, you don't see me, God. God is saying, didn't I save you? Didn't I give you my son Jesus? Didn't I forgive you of your sins? Of your sins? Didn't I forgive you? Didn't I give you a purpose in this life? Didn't I give you something, even if it was seemed so small in the beginning, to be faithful with? Have you been faithful with that little thing there? Sometimes we complain at God and we need to look in the mirror and realize, you know what? I haven't been serving. I haven't honored God with my life. He saved me and rescued me, and then I could care less about what I do after that. Come on, now it's quiet in here all of a sudden. I'm just kidding. So how can I serve God? Well, well, there's so many ways we can serve God. We could serve God by taking care of those next to us that are in need. We can serve God by using whatever gifts he's giving you. You can serve God by loving the unlovable. You can serve God by giving. You can serve God by praying for somebody. You can serve God by worshiping. You can serve God by making disciples. You can serve God by preaching the gospel. You can serve God. Like, like we had a whole group. This is so cool. I'm pulling in, and we have a whole parking lot team that's outside in the freezing cold. I get out of my car. I'm running in these doors. That's how cold I am. Don't make fun of me. Don't laugh. I'm freezing. And we got our parking lot team out there getting us a parking spot, guiding and leading and directing us, and they're just serving us. Come on, Robbie, great job. We got our media team serving on the cameras right now. We got our greeters serving. We got our Kids World team up there taking care of all of our babies. All day, your babies have been going crazy, and you're like, I can't wait to drop them off at Kids World. And they're taking your crazy babies and serving you so you can get this word. 
We got our youth teams in there serving. We got our prison teams over there in the prison serving those that are in prison. We got our senior team serving the seniors. We got our Dot the Block team serving the streets of San Bernardino. We got our young adult teams rescuing a generation in the city. Come on, we got teams all over. So we cannot say that God does not have a place for you to serve. There's a place for you. There's room for you. And God is calling us to serve him. That's why he heals us. You are not healed to go back to the sickness. I'll say that again. You are not healed to go back to the sickness. See, we know that this fever was meant to kill this woman. This mother-in-law, she had this fever. It was a lethal sickness, and she was most likely going to die because of it. At this time, this was a lethal sickness. They were, she, she had days to live. But Jesus saved this woman from death. So when Jesus saves you from death, do not go back to death. When Jesus rescues you from sin, do not go back to the, to the sin. When Jesus sets you free from drug addiction, do not go back to those things. It has nothing for you. The world has nothing for you. Your past relationships got nothing for you. Your old lifestyle got nothing for you. Come on. Your old parties, your old circles, it got nothing for you. We got to stop going back. Someone say, don't go back. Look at Proverbs 26, 11. It says, as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his foolishness. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Help me, Lord. Someone just say, help me, Lord. Now, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's like a gross analogy in the Bible. I mean, dogs have been doing that since the Bible was written. They have not evolved. They still do that. Okay, do anyone have a dog? I'm not even going to ask if you've seen it. It's, it's nasty. They spit it out, and they're like, ooh, what's that? All right. As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his foolishness. It's gross, it's nasty, but the reality is I wonder how, how gross and nasty it looks in the spirit when we spit something up, we get set free from something, and we go back and say, mm, what's this? Sounds gross, but the reality is, is that what we're doing? When we go back, that word return, when it says, when, when, we're going, uh, when it says um, the word return, as a dog, go back to the scripture really, oh yeah, there it is. Return means to go back, to allow to come back, or to bring back. We must, and this is a thing, with, with, with the Bible saying here, we must not return. We must not go back. We must not allow back. We must not bring back. See, some, some things, some areas you can't go back to, and there's some people you cannot allow back in your life. There's some, there's some habits you used to have that you cannot allow back in your life anymore. There's things that maybe they used, to, they used to come to you and you cannot allow them to bring back anything that used to come. We, we, gotta, we, gotta, reti we gotta get rid of our old way of living. Old choices, old habits, old circles, old places, old friends, old parties, old blocks, old conversations. Come on, we gotta get rid of some things. You know that a demon, and, and, and I'm not going to spend much time, much time longer, but I got to say this. You know that a demon desires to return after you've been set free? Demons look for places that are kept and in order. Look at the Bible. It says in Matthew 12, 44, then it says, it is talking about these demons. It's talking about evil spirits. Then it says, I will return to the person I came from. There goes that word return again. I will return, I will go back, I will come back, I will bring back. And it says, so it returns and finds its former home empty. That word empty, underline that word. We're gonna come back to it. I find it swept, I find it in order. Verse 45, then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they will all enter the person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. That will be the experience of this evil generation. 
Let's go back to that word. Notice that when we said empty, he says he's looking for empty. This is what the word empty means in the Greek. It's skolasonanta, which means this. This is crazy. To cease from labor, to loiter, to be free from labor, to be at leisure, to be idle, or to be unoccupied. You know what the devil's looking for? He's looking for people that are healed and unoccupied. The devil's looking for people that have been set free but are inactive in the kingdom. You went to God, you got your healing, and you said, I'm good, God, I'm going to go my own way. You got saved, you got delivered from your past, and now you refuse to do anything for the Lord. You will not serve him, you will not live for him, you will not uh, find ways to use your gift to glorify him. You got saved, and then you just stopped. The devil's looking, that word empty, isn't it crazy? The word empty literally means to cease from labor. See, the enemy cannot enter a house when you're busy, when you're active, when you're alive, when you're laboring, when you're serving the kingdom, when you're living for God. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The devil can't touch you when you're living for the Lord. But he is hoping to find someone that's been delivered, but still inactive. Idleness doesn't lead to growth. It leads to your past. I'll say that again. Idleness doesn't lead to growth. It leads to your past. You want to know the fastest way to backslide? Stop serving God. I've met people... I've met people, I've seen this happen over and over. I've seen it actually in my life where I stopped serving God. I got cold, I got stagnant. I thought I was still an on fire, awesome Christian. And I hear people say this I'm gonna take a break from serving. Just pause. It's not my season, it's not my time. It's me time right now, just me and the Lord. The devil's like, perfect, perfect, perfect. Let me get my boys. Let me get my seven other spirits. They're inactive. The house is empty. There's no activity. There's no movement. There's no anointing. There's no spirit. Now I can come in and find an empty, an inactive, a loitering, an idle house. Help us, Lord. Don't chase God for your healing and then abandon him once you got it. You're saved. You're healed and you're set free to serve Jesus, just like this mother-in-law, just like this woman. And we serve Jesus with the gratitude. We serve him with thanksgiving. This is why you see teams here that are serving you every single week, and they do it with gratitude because they know what they got saved from. There's people here, you'll see people that are greeting at the door and you have no idea what they've been saved from, what they've been rescued from, and they're serving with a smile because they are thankful that God rescued them from death, rescued them from that fever, rescued them from damnation, rescued them from hell. This is why we serve. We serve with gratitude. We serve with thankfulness. See, our greatest title is not Pastor so-and-so. Greatest title in here isn't senior bishop doctorate of the uh, evangelistic denomination of the world. The greatest title we can wear is just to be a faithful servant of Jesus. I want to be called a servant. And our greatest goal should be this, that when we live this life, when we die, when we pass on, when we're no longer here, we hear these words from the Lord. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You served me. He's not going to say, well done, good and faithful pastor. Well done, good and faithful bishop. Well done, good and faithful worship leader. Well He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. I saved you, and you lived your life to serve my kingdom, I, I rescued you, and you made it your life mission to rescue others. I pulled you out of the pit, and you allowed me to use you as a vessel to pull others out of the same pit that you were once in. This is why we're saved. God saved me for a reason. Come on, how many believe God saved you for a reason? Worship team can come out. See, whatever it is that you're going through right now, 
whatever pain you're experiencing, whatever bondage you feel like is, it, you have in your life, all of these things is nothing for the Lord. It's not too big for him. It's not too much of a match for God that he can't handle whatever sickness, life-threatening disease, the spiritual bondage that you're going through. He can save you and set you free. And I believe this, when he saves you, he doesn't just leave you. He never abandons you. But he's called you to live with a sense of purpose, with life, and with power. And I want to ask you tonight, if you're in this room and you feel like you don't, you're not living with a sense of purpose, you have no direction in life. Matter of fact, you feel like if you were to die tonight, if you were to die tonight, you do not know where you would spend eternity. The Bible says that all of us have fallen short. We've all made mistakes. How many know that that's true? We've all made mistakes. We've all sinned before God. And the Bible says that the wages or the price of our sin is death. That means I owe a price for the sin that I've committed. It's on me. And the price that I have to pay is death. It's eternal separation from God. The consequence for my sin is that I'll spend eternity in hell forever. That's the consequence of my sin. It's a consequence of our sin. And we owe that price. Because God loves you so much, but because God sees you and doesn't ignore you, and he knows the condition of your heart, and he loves you and wants to set you free, because God has this for you, God sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross and to pay the price that you and I owe. It's a price that we should be paying but Jesus gladly and willingly and lovingly took it upon himself. He took upon himself our affliction. He took upon himself our sickness, our sin. He took it upon himself. And the Bible says that anyone who confesses Jesus as their Lord, who repents of their sin, can be saved. Today, you can be saved. Tonight could be your night of breakthrough. And from this moment forward, you can say this, I'm free. I'm forgiven. My past doesn't dictate my future anymore. My sin no longer has control on me. I no longer am headed to hell. I'm heading to heaven because Jesus paid the price so that I can be forgiven and set free. And it's not based on how good you are. It's not based on how talented you are. Remember, that's not what God's looking for. God is looking for a servant. Someone will just say yes to him. Someone that will surrender. Are you ready to surrender to Jesus tonight? I'm going to count to three, and if you're ready to surrender to Jesus, if you're saying, this is my night, I'm letting it all go, and I want to give my heart to Jesus, bring it to him. Bring your pain, bring your sin, bring your addiction. Don't try to leave and clean up your life and come back to God. It, it, it doesn't work. We can never clean ourselves up. It would just make more of a mess. God is saying, just come to me. I can set you free. We count to three, and if that's you, and you're saying, I need to come to Jesus tonight, and I need to give my life to him. When I count to three, I just want you to raise your hand all over this room. Are we ready? Here we go. One, two, three. You're saying, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I see you guys. I'm proud of you. I see you two over there. I'm proud of you. I see you two over here to my right. I'm proud of you. I see you back there. Everybody else, raise your hand so I can see you really quick. I see all you guys right there. I see this whole row. I'm proud of you guys. I see you to my left. I see you over here. I'm proud of you guys. Can we do this? I see you back there. Good job. You just raise your hand because you're saying, I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'm surrendering to him. I'm not perfect, but he is, and I need a savior. That's why you raise your hand. God is celebrating. Heaven is celebrating right now. Let's do this. Before we leave, let's all stand to our feet right now. And everybody that raised your hand, everybody that raised your hand, listen to me. I want you to do me one more favor. Could you make your way out of your seat? And could you come forward right now? I want you to make a statement right now in front of your friends and family. And you're saying, I'm letting go. I'm leaving my life behind. And I'm going to come up and give my life to Jesus. Make your way out of your seat. Those that raise your hands, we have a team up here that wants to pray with you and meet you and congratulate you. Come on, church. Let's give them a round of applause as they make their way forward right now.
Come on, if that's you, make your way forward. You're saying, I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm proud of you. They're still coming. We're still clapping for them. Come on, let's get excited for every soul, church. It's what it's all about right here, this moment, right here. God is so good. I'm going to make one more call very quickly. You're saying this, like, I I got saved, and I have not been serving my king. He healed me and set me free, and I've been, I've been a little too idle. And this is my wake-up call, and I'm ready to make this a year where I serve God to the fullest. I'm not going to sit on the sideline. I'm not going to let the devil come back to an empty house, but I'm ready to serve God to the fullest. If that's you, I want you to make your way out of your seat and leave all that behind and come up to the front and say, I'm done and I'm ready to serve Jesus to the fullest tonight. Come on, come on up. You're saying, that's me. I'm done living my life on the sideline. I'm done being living on the back burner. I'm done being unoccupied and I'm ready to give. Come on, they're coming up. Let's give them a hand as they make their way up. I'm proud of you guys. That's a big, I'm proud of you. Good job. Good job. Good job. Amen. Amen. Come forward if that's you. Proud of you guys. All right. For those that came forward, we're going to help you. We're going to pray with you. And what we want you to do, your next step is to get baptized. There's a class that's called Starting at the Way, where you learn what it means to be baptized. And we're going to help you get baptized and totally follow God. And we're going to disciple you. We're going to train you and be there for you. And the person in front of you, they're going to pray with you, and they're going to sign you up for this class. Okay, we ready? Bow your heads with me, and let's pray. Let's give her a hand. You're coming forward right now. I'm so proud of them. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. Say, Jesus, thank you for seeing me when no one else did. I've sinned against you. I've fallen short. I'm not perfect. But you, but you died on the cross, and you rose from the dead to set me free, to heal me, and to save me. You saved me from the penalty of my own sin. So I repent. I turn away from my old life, and I give my heart to you. And from this moment forward, I'll never be the same. I will live to serve you. I will live to please you. I am your servant. Fill me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit and make me a new creation. Thank you, Jesus. I put my faith in you. In Jesus' name I pray. And we all say amen and amen. Can we end this night giving one more shout of praise to Jesus tonight? He's a good God. We love you, church. God bless you. Young adults, we're going to be here Friday night for Relationship Seminar Night 1. And this Sunday, Pastor Marco is bringing an on-time fire word. You don't want to miss this Sunday. God bless you. We love you. Have a wonderful night. Remember, if God is for you, there is no one who can come against you. God bless you. Have a wonderful night.